It's about six o'clock, so I think we're about ready to get started. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight for this presentation um, with the historical fort and Christiana. Um, MCAT is here to record. So we do have the microphones going um, just as a housekeeping thing at the end. If you've got questions, I will come around with the microphone so they can hear what you're saying. Um, this is a presentation for Black History Month, but we also do other historical programming very regularly, like our For History Buffs. So if you would like any more information on that, we've got a sign-up sheet over there, and there's also um, forms to give feedback if you'd like to for this program. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello. <clears throat> Um, I'm Christiana, I'm the Education Director at the Historical Museum at Fort Missoula. I'm really happy to be here today to share the story of the 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps. I'm just gonna say, um, I have a bit of a cold, I don't have COVID, but um, I'm gonna, I hope I can make it through without losing my voice. So <laughs> we'll just do our best and we'll see how far we get. Um, this is a, um, one of my favorite stories about Fort Missoula is the 25th Infantry. It's complex, um, but it's interesting and it's a wonderful celebration of kind of some amazing things that happened um, more than 125 years ago. Clearly she was in the wrong room. <laughs> um, <clears throat> before I get started, um, I just wanted to say the Historical Museum wants to acknowledge that we're in the um, ancestral homelands of the Salish and Kalispell people and that we honor and respect um, their indigenous nations and whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. I just went to a program today that was um, <clears throat> run by a member of the uh, Salish tribe and it was super fascinating. But it's Black History Month and we are talking about the Bicycle Corps. Um, <clears throat> Oh, I forgot. See, this is why I put this slide first so I wouldn't forget. We have some fun events coming up at the fort if you hadn't been out there before. We have a crafternoon, which is just a drop in, come make some fun, um, what are we doing? Collages. Um, and then we have a history head to toe community fashion show. So people have been invited to wear something that's either historically inspired or historic to their own lives. Um, so that's gonna be a fun event. I need volunteer judges for History Day on March 1st. So if you want to see some middle schoolers demonstrate their knowledge of history, um, I should probably have put my email address up there, but you can find me through the Historical Museum's website. And we have a new exhibit in our big gallery about the Civilian Conservation Corps that's going to open on March 24th. And then Forestry Day is kind of our first big event of the spring. Um, that's Saturday, April 29th. If you want to come watch people throw axes and run on logs. I promise it's lots of fun. So, <clears throat> so today we're talking about the 25th Infantry at Fort Missoula. Um, just so I know what your background knowledge is, if you feel like you've been to many uh, bicycle soldier things and you know the basics, thumbs up. If you've never heard anything about them, thumbs down. If you're somewhere in between, let me know. Okay, so, okay, great. So we got a, a good mix here. So hopefully I don't bore the ones that know lots about it. Uh, but there will be time for questions in the end. And maybe we can get into some little nooks and crannies of the stories that I don't have in my slides. I also brought some artifacts from the museum. So afterwards, you're welcome to come up. I ask that you don't touch them. Um, but we've got some tent pegs like they would have used, a bicycle seat, and then some other bits of equipment here. So fun stuff to look at. <clears throat> so Fort Missoula looks a little bit different than it did in uh, 1888 when um, the 25th Infantry first came to Fort Missoula. It's a little bit more like this one here. So the <clears throat> if you've been, um, who's been to the Fort Missoula grounds recently? Okay, so the museum is over here. And then the parade grounds are that big empty space where we park during... Um, the 4th of July is just beyond, just beyond the uh, flagpole there. And if you notice, there's kind of a grassy area that's got a fence around it that's an archaeological site. That's the old officer's row. And <clears throat> then we can see some of the other buildings that they would have used during that time. So that's more like what the fort looked like um, when the Buffalo Soldiers were there. Um, that was, that's an example of one of the barrack buildings. Yeah. Sure, uh, I can try. Does that work better? Oh, that makes sense, thank you. You can tell I don't use microphones often. I talk to groups of 53rd graders and yell a lot. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that feedback. 
Um, this is one of the other buildings that's still there. This one was built in 1878, and it was the non-commissioned officer's quarters. So that would have been, we'll learn a little bit more about Mingo Sanders later, and that would have been where he lived. So who were Buffalo Soldiers? So um, I, I gathered from your hands that most of you guys had heard of Buffalo Soldiers before. So it's another term that we use to describe the black soldiers when the army was segregated. So shortly after the end of, well I should say, African American and black soldiers have served in every military campaign in US history and, and valiantly. And so the Buffalo Soldiers that we're talking about today are no different in that way. After the end of the Civil War, there was a peacetime uh, colored troop um, decree that the Congress decided that they needed uh, um, several units. It ended up with being the 9th and 10th Cavalry, and then the 24th and 25th Infantry. And most of them were sent west. During the Indian Wars, there were about 20% of the soldiers in the west were African American. So, and you can kind of sort of think about the politics of the time. Um, and the sort of Reconstruction era, all the way up to Jim Crow laws, um, it, it, was, it made sense to move uh, black soldiers west, um, and in that way they were also managing and controlling the Indian populations in the west. So it's a complicated story because we have an oppressed people also helping to control another oppressed people in the United States. So pretty interesting, that is a story for a whole nother day. Um, so as I mentioned, um, out here in the West, they did things like um, deal with Indian uprisings and then did a lot of drilling, helping with mining disputes, things like that. So sort of like a police force. Sometimes they were um, a peacekeeping force between white settlers and native folks. Sometimes it was between different indigenous tribes. Um, but, you know, over that time period, there were um, a lot of interesting stories from Texas all the way up to Montana and Wyoming. <clears throat> at Fort Missoula, um, we had several companies at different time periods. So mostly we're talking about the time period from um, 1888 to, to 1898, but we also had the 24th Infantry here in the early 1900s. <clears throat> Um, so today we're focusing on the Great Bicycle Experiment. So 125 years from last year, we had soldiers that um, <clears throat> were riding bicycles to test out if the bicycle was better for military transportation than the horse was. So you can think um, there are lots of great things about horses. Uh, they use their own power. You don't have to be strong, but you have to feed them. They can be shot. Um, they have limits. So the idea was, you know, if you had a bicycle, maybe you could sneak up a little bit easier. You might be able to um, rely on your own self, but you can also think there are probably some problems with bicycles too, which we'll get to. So the first training rides were around the Missoula and Bitterroot Valley. Um, they learned to ford rivers with their bicycles and they ended up deciding that <coughs> they would take a pole between two people, and that was actually a more effective way than hucking it over each of their um, own backs. But they had to learn how to ford rivers. They had to climb 10-foot fences passing bicycles over, and they had a, a really quick way to do that. They drilled in formation in the parade grounds, um, <clears throat> and they just st started to really get used to what it would be like to go on a long Ride. Some of the initial eight soldiers that were uh, bicyclists only had about six weeks to get ready for that first big ride, ride to the Mission Mountains. So imagine never being on a bike before and then six weeks later being on a bike um, going all the way to McDonald Lake. So that went pretty well. We can see that this picture is actually pretty near Fort Missoula. As you can see on their bicycles, they um, would pack their gear and we'll talk a little bit more about what that ended up being when they went to St. Louis. <clears throat> they had a, a rifle strung to their back, and one of the cyclists was a mechanic who had a, a box of tools with them. Um, just sort of back up a little bit, the way the military was organized at that time, although all the soldiers here were black, the, they still had white officers, with the exception of a chaplain. Um, their chaplain was African American, so they kept that sort of hierarchy. Lieutenant Moss, we'll talk about him a little bit later too, um, was last in his class at West Point, 
Um, so he got the honor of being sent to middle of nowhere, Montana. Uh, but he was very passionate about cycling and he <laughs> found the Colonel Nelson Miles was also passionate about cycling. So at that point he was able to take it on um, as his project. This is on their <laughs> trip to Yellowstone. And so Yellowstone is our first big trip. So I'm gonna double check my numbers here. The Yellowstone trip, they left. So they did the Mission Mountain one, that went well. So a month later they decided to go to Yellowstone. And that was sort of their first long-term trip. It was 800 miles round trip from Fort Missoula to Yellowstone. And on that ride, they encountered many different kinds of weather, road conditions, friendly people, less friendly people. And you can see these pictures here are pretty iconic. You've got the photo on the uh, terraces near Mammoth Hot Springs, which you obviously could never bring a bike on now. <laughs> and then up at Old Faithful. And I love to think about, you know, these guys riding their bikes around Old Faithful and imagine we're talking uh, 18, 96 here um, and so imagine the Victorian tourists you know tourism is starting to happen you've got these ladies in their dresses with their parasols probably and these black soldiers uh, riding around on bicycles so it must have been an interesting sight uh, just a close-up there of some of the soldiers looking very dapper they had special uh, uniforms for the the journey um, to be a little bit more sort of athletic so they have their their sort of outdoor hat and um, leggings uh, and boots. And the leggings were, co were called um, the color of dead grass is how it's described. So some of the reenactors and I have gone back and forth on the phone like, is that like a brown or a tan? Like what kind of dead grass? And then this one you can see um, Private Finley there. He was their mechanic. He, they got really lucky because he had been a bicycle mechanic in Chicago for two years before he enlisted. So he was a, a great person to have on board. And every day at the end of their journey, he would, everybody would start to rest for the evening and then he'd go to work on the bikes. Because inevitably, you know, we talked about pros and cons of bicycles. Um, something's gonna break down and you don't have a part store, you know, right around the corner to, to pick up a new chain. Um, <clears throat> So he would often work through the night to repair flats. Sometimes they would have to pay just exorbitant amounts of money to blacksmiths along the way to make, make them apart um, because there just weren't all the, that many bike stores along the way. Okay, and so on that trip to Yellowstone, most of the same guys, or some of the same guys from um, the first journey. Um, and then, okay, so I'm just gonna read this quote from Lieutenant Moss. The soldiers who composed the Corps were selected from among 40 volunteers and are bubbling over with, with enthusiasm. They are all colored men and about as fine looking and well disciplined as a lot as could be found anywhere in the United States Army. They take pride in their uniform, they are respectful, obedient, and have implicit, uh, have implicit in their white, I think it's implicit faith in their white officers. Last fact as well as illustrated by an incident that happened last summer while we were going through Yellowstone Park on our bicycles. And I'll just make a little aside here. So we have newspaper reports and we have Lieutenant Moss's descriptions, but we don't have anything from the soldiers. So the only thing that we have describing the soldiers is usually from sort of a stereotypical, sort of paternalistic um, perspective. So as I read this, you can kind of keep that in mind. A member of the Corps upon whose face was the map of Africa is most unquestionably stamped, was lazily stand, sitting against a tree smoking his pipe, and with one eye closed and the other eye half open was amusing himself making smoke rings. This is the funny part. A tourist who came strolling along asked him, where do you expect to go today, which she answered, which, to which he answered, the Lord only knows we're following the lieutenant. And so there's kind of a quote, like they, they were just a, a following orders, they're just following the lieutenant. So I would love to know what they actually thought about it. Did they think this guy was nuts? Did they just feel like they were, you know, they could be drilling in at Fort Missoula and bored, so this was better? It would be wonderful to know. Um, so the third test, so that Yellowstone happened in 1896. They take uh, a year to um, talk to Spalding where they're getting their bikes, make some improvements, improved that saddle, um, and got... Um, no more wooden rims, they got metal rims, so because they were having the rims delaminate, which is very inconvenient if you're trying to ride a bike to St. Louis. 
And I've uh, highlighted in purple there the returning soldiers that were on this journey that were on the previous one. So not too many of the same ones. Um, but he also in this, uh, for this trip, because it's so much longer, they added um, Assistant Surgeon Kennedy, who was a white officer, and um, E.H. Booz, who was a reporter from the Missoulian. He was 19. But thankfully, because of um, Mr. Booz, uh, we have daily reports of their journey to St. Louis. So it, it adds like invaluable amounts of information. And a musician, although I have been informed musician just means bugler. So not as exciting. Uh, the, the, as an aside, the 25th Infantry did have an amazing band that for the decade that they were in stationed at Fort Missoula, they traveled all over the state for different celebrations and were really well, well known. We have a second, we have an online exhibit about that in case you're interested, speaking of musicians. So here's the route, starting <clears throat> up there at Fort Missoula and going through several states there. Uh, they found that for the most part, people were very friendly to them and they were able, um, I think they were in Big Timber um, and there was a retired Civil War uh, soldier there who decided to buy everybody drinks. He made them all come to town with them to buy them drinks. Um, <clears throat> and, but as they went south, it got a little bit uh, more dicey and by the time they got to St. Louis, um, the officers, white officers, would eat separately from the soldiers themselves. They still were cheered as they came into St. Louis, though. So here's some <clears throat> uh, illustrations from the St. Louis dispatch from when they arrived in, in St. Louis. Um, they had seen 1,900 miles of trail and road by the time they arrived in St. Louis. They had to deal with alkali water, they had, they got separated in sandstorms. They had all sorts of different things happen to them throughout their 41 days riding their bikes. They averaged about 50 miles a day um, and they had supply stops every two days or so so that they could um, get, they would be motivated to get to the resupply stop but then they wouldn't have to pack all that gear. Um, a little bit back to the gear there just grab my notes here. So each bicycle carried a knapsack, a blanket roll, and a shelter strapped to the handlebar. They actually had sort of two sides of a pup, of a pup tent. The one partner would have one side, the other one would have the other side. Um, each rider carried a rifle and 50 rounds of ammunition. ammunition. Um, <clears throat> in their luggage carriers, they had um, things like pots and pans, um, and different like beans and coffee and that sort of thing. Um, Lieutenant Moss kept meticulous notes because he was gonna report at the end of this to the Army and that's actually available um, as an electronic book that you can look at today. So you can look at all of his lists. He took records of how big each person was, he measurements and things to see how the journey changed them over time and um, to make recommendations for later uh, transport. So Lieutenant, Moss, as I mentioned, so he was um, the young officer. He was 25 when he got to Fort Missoula. Um, <clears throat> he had a, a very good friend who was there with him who died. And one of the things people think is, you know, he was motivated to like really get obsessed with this bicycling because he was mourning the loss of his friend. Um, <clears throat> that's just speculation though. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, he took these great records and he actually did the math and said that it was actually less expensive to travel in this way via bicycle and it took less time than it would have um, regular horse cavalry. So his recommendation was let's keep going with the bikes and he was raring to go. He wanted to go to San Francisco the next year so that they could go over the Sierras as well, which would have been pretty crazy. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to bring my outline today, so I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but I did want to read the celebrating of the achievement, the, the report by reporter Booz to the Daily Missoulian when they got to St. Louis, because the celebration in St. Louis was pretty impressive. The 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps reached St. Louis yesterday, and their entry was witnessed by 40,000 people. The news comes through Colonel Burt, who was notified by wire by Lieutenant Moss in command of the Corps. On June 14th, the Corps left Fort Missoula, making the trip over mountain roads, cactus beds, and wagon roads in 32 days. It was a grand ride. Oh, it was 41. Uh, 
It was a grand ride and beset with many difficulties from the insistent rains along the route. Few accidents were reported and those of no consequence. There were no delays made for pleasure and the boys pedaled hard to make a good record and have accomplishment have accomplished it. The whole world was watching the result and the bicycle and the army of the U United States will hinge upon Lieutenant Moss's report of the trip. So it was uh, covered very widely um, and people really were got excited about seeing them in their town. Um, in the end, the Spanish-American War broke out shortly after they got back to Missoula. They ended up riding the train back to Missoula, which disappointed Lieutenant Moss, but I don't think it disappointed anybody else. They got their train ride back. And then um, <clears throat> the next year was the Spanish-American War. They were among the first troops to be sent to Cuba to fight the war. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned earlier that we don't have records of what the 25th Infantry thought about the Bicycle Corps, which is disappointing. And, un and unfortunately, most of the photos we have of the 25th Infantry are not labeled. So I've, I just have two examples here. This uh, one on the left there, um, Private James D. Cowan. He was, this is from Fort Custer, and so we actually know his name, which is great. Um, this guy here, we have a whole set of these from some uh, noted Missoula photographers, so we know they were 25th Infantry in Missoula, but unfortunately we don't know what their names are. This one has a sharpshooter uh, medal though, so I think there are some people that are digging to try to, to match up faces on muster lists with pictures, but I'm not sure that we'll ever know for sure who everybody is. Um, the couple of folks in the 25th Infantry that we do know a lot about is, um, one of them is Theophilus Stewart, who has like the coolest name in the history of names. Theophilus Gold Stewart. Um, and he was the chaplain for the 25th Infantry. He ended up writing a book called 50 Years in the Gospel Ministry. So it's basically his life story. And he does tell some stories about Missoula. Um, for the most part, while the 25th were in Missoula, um, we don't see the kind of racism that you, you hear about in the South or Texas. Um, <clears throat> even in Minnesota, the, one of the reasons why, oh, nope, sorry, I'm getting my stories mixed up. That was for the 24th. Backtrack. Okay, so we don't hear as many of the stories of just like blatant racism, but Theophilus being a chaplain um, often met up with other army chaplains, white or black, and he had a friend who was coming into town and was staying at the Florence. And so he, his friend invited him to dinner. He showed up to dinner and, you know, reported at the front of the Florence and said, I'm here to visit my friend for dinner. And they got all flustered and they called his friend and his, we took his friend aside. <clears throat> his friend came back out and he said, I'm really sorry, but they won't let you eat here. They say that if you eat here, then everyone else will leave. And so he'd never been treated like this. He'd been in, in Montana for years. Um, and so he went back to the fort, you know, feeling bad for his friend, for his friend getting embarrassed and getting frustrated. So he went to Colonel Burt and said, this is what happened. And Colonel Burt ended up um, going with him back to the Florence the next day uh, or several days later. <coughs> Theophilus wrote a letter to the Missoulian that got covered in other newspapers as well saying, you know, this is, you know, unheard of that you're treating me like this. And the owners of the Florence ended up uh, issuing him an apology. So it still happened in Montana, but like he had grounds and support to protest it. Um, just a side note, he had two wives. Um, his second wife, um, well, not at the same time. <laughs> his second wife was um, actually the third licensed doctor, black woman doctor in the United States, I believe. Um, and she was from New York and was part of the, also part of the Montauk tribe. I'm not sure if I said that right, but just kind of an interesting story. So if you ever need somebody random in history to research um, Theophilus Stewart, he's written much more than just 50 years in the gospel ministry, but he's a very interesting person. Not on the bike ride, but he was the chaplain for the 25th Infantry, including the bicycle soldiers. Um, then uh, Mingo Sanders, has anybody heard of Mingo Sanders before? Any familiar? Aha. He is such a fascinating person. So Mingo Sanders was a career soldier. Um, <clears throat> he, re he was, re it's been reported that he was a little kid watching a military parade and decided that he wanted to be a soldier. So it was like a lifelong dream of him. And he ended up being the sergeant in charge when they did the trip to St. Louis. So not the first two. Um, Colonel Burt said he was the greatest NCO 
he had never known. Now, I, I've never been in the military, but I've, I've heard that sergeants or non-commissioned officers are sort of the like uh, backbone of the military. They're the ones that, you know, we've got the colonels that are making the decisions, but then the sergeants are actually the ones that make the men um, do their job. And <clears throat> so he was very, very well respected among his men, very important on this ride to St. Louis. Um, <clears throat> Later, when they went to Cuba, he was with the 25th Infantry when the Rough Riders with Teddy Roosevelt uh, got into a bad place and ran out of food, and he ordered his men to share their rations with them, which is even sadder when you learn about the Brownsville affair, which we'll get to. Um, <clears throat> he ended up being dishonorably discharged about less than two years before he was due to retire with a pension in uh, a very sad um, situation called the Brownsville Affair. Um, okay, we're not going to read that part. I'm not going to read that part either. I'll get back to that. Okay, um, so, and the reason why I'm skipping is because I want to tell you about the Brownsville Affair. But before that, this is when they were <clears throat> leaving M Missoula for the last time after being a part of the community for 10 years. You can see the Higgins Bridge back there, and we're looking at the Hammond Arcade. So where up until recently, um, the El Cazador was here and um, the Wilma is here now. If you guys can kind of picture that, everybody know where we're looking? Okay. Um, <clears throat> and they left on Easter Sunday and they actually had to delay Easter ser services because so many people came out to wish them well on their way to Cuba. So that was kind of the impact that they had um, in Missoula for that 10 years. So the Brownsville Affair, okay. So the 25th Infantry leaves Fort Missoula in 1898. Several years later, they, they go to fight in Cuba, they go to fight in the Philippines, and then they end up in Brownsville, Texas in 1906, of all places. <clears throat> and what happened was they didn't want them in Texas, they didn't want to be in Texas, the officers were really nervous about it, and it was only a couple months until there was some kind of dust up in town, and someone was killed. And the townspeople all said, oh, it was the soldiers. The soldiers shot them. They went back to the fort. All the officers, the white officers, all confirmed that all of the soldiers were where they were supposed to be. They, most of them were in the barracks, but two of them were um, visiting uh, lady friends in town, but they all knew where everybody was. None of the ammunition was missing. Like, there's no reason to believe that they were guilty of it. But all this weird political stuff happens where Teddy Roosevelt gets it in his head that, he's go that these guys didn't, I mean, it's more complicated than that, but Roosevelt ends up having them all discharged without honor, which is so ironic because one of them was Sergeant Mingo Sanders who had helped them when they were stranded um, <clears throat> in Cuba. And, Teddy, and Mingo Sanders even sent a telegram to Teddy Roosevelt. Nobody knows for sure if he actually got to see it or not. Um, some were able to petition for a re-enlistment, and then in the 1970s, so decades later, um, some, uh, a reporter started digging around and finding the original documents, and um, it got sort of brought back up and put before Congress again, and the government decided to um, basically pardon them all and replace their discharge without honor to a discharge with honor, and, but there was only one living at that time. Um, so, and then we can see a political cartoon from here. There's a lot of like, you can get really cynical about it looking into it because um, this happened in 1906, but they didn't get that discharge without honor until 1908, and it, Roosevelt waited till after the election, and so there's all all of that stuff. So I guess politics doesn't change that much. Um, <clears throat> but you can see, you know, as he's candidate Roosevelt, I believe in the square deal every time. And then down here after he's the president, I don't care how long and honorable any of your records are, you're all discharged, get out. Um, so another fascinating part of history, I feel like I went into this job really liking both Roosevelt's and then I learned about the internment at Fort Missoula and this and I'm like, man, destroying my history heroes. Um, <laughs> so I want to go back a little bit to um, some of uh, this, so this one's a really long one, I'm not gonna read that one. So I told you that there isn't much record of the soldiers themselves and what they thought about it. 
there's this guy out here who's a history teacher in Wyoming, and he has a blog, a website that he put together 12 years ago, and he dissected all of the newspaper articles from um, that, uh, that they were reporting in, those, uh, in that 1897. He put them all on the same website, and he finds the greatest gem. So he found this, which is a quote from Private Route. It says, Private Route told a Globe Democrat reporter that they regarded their trip as a great success. He stated that they had encountered numerous obstacles on the way. Um, on June 17th, they met a tremendous snowstorm while crossing the main divide of the Rocky Mountains near Ellison, Montana, at a distance of more than 4,000 feet above the sea level. Their greatest difficulty was experienced in passing through the sand hills of Nebraska. They had to walk through 185 miles of sand, pushing their bicycles before them, <clears throat> the thermometer registering 110 degrees in the shade. While they had enjoyed the venture, said Private Route, they were glad to be on the return trip and going by rail instead of traversing the route again in the manner in which they'd come. They left Monday night on the train, uh, and then eventually they have to march a little bit. So. There is one, there's one quote from a newspaper from one of the actual soldiers. And then there's also this fun one from Route again. So uh, this is a few years after uh, they were done in the Philippines. Private Richard Route um, of the 25th Infantry, which is now stationed in the southwestern part of the country, writes the following letter to Edward Booz, so that reporter, showing how disappointed the boys of the 25th are to not be ordered back to Missoula to our, I'm sorry, how disappointed the boys are in not being ordered back to Missoula. Route was a member of the 25th Infantry Bicycle Corps, which made the memorable trip from Fort Missoula to St. Louis on bicycles last year. Okay, so it was only a year different, but. Um, Dear sir, here we are back to this glorious country once more after fighting for our country in Cuba. Still the boys of the 25th are not satisfied. satisfied. We all wanted to go back to dear old Missoula because we did good work in Cuba and wanted to get back to our old station so we could tell our friends the story. The 25th is scattered everywhere in Arizona with headquarters at Fort Logan, California. There are only two of the Bicycle Corps boys here, Froman and myself. Froman was badly wounded in battle. Please remember us to everybody in the Garden City, which we shall always look to as the best place on earth. Yours truly, Richard Rout. So that's pretty resounding. You know, he was pretty happy with his time here. And it was nice to know that he has a, had a friendship that remained with that reporter. Um, there are a couple folks in town that have been researching the 25th and the 24th and sort of their connection to um, the black population of Montana, of Missoula, in the early 1900s. And it turns out that there are several members of the 25th Infantry and the 24th Infantry that ended up, um, after they were done with service, were able to return and buy homes on the north and west side. <clears throat> One of the families was Dorsey. Um, some of his children are buried at the post cemetery at Fort Missoula. Um, <clears throat> and so there is this feeling looking at sort of the results of it that their time in Montana in Missoula was positive and not just because they have this cool um, uh, bicycle adventure to talk about. Um, <clears throat> okay, talk about Brownsville. All right, legacy. I'm talking too fast. We're gonna, we're gonna go home early tonight, guys. Um, <clears throat> so, the legacy of the bicycle soldiers. So, even though it, it seems like a really amazing thing that they accomplished to us, I do think for the most part, they were soldiers, they were career soldiers, they were following orders. And so, we don't get these like long, um, even uh, in Theophilus's book, you know, he wasn't in the bicycle soldiers, but he doesn't talk about it there. So, it didn't seem like it seemed like almost a blip in the career radar of these guys. They weren't talking about it. So it wasn't really until the 1970s that sort of the people's interest started perking up and people started looking into this story. Um, but now <clears throat> um, we have a group of reenactors. Um, this is Bobby McDonald here. Um, he's a character and a really great planner. So he ended up uh, finding out about the Buffalo Soldiers at Fort Missoula. His family, um, is, he's descended from the 9th and 10th Cavalry, and he um, is part of the Cavalry Association in Los Angeles. So he got a bunch of folks together, and we all realized it was going to be the 125th anniversary and that we should all get together and celebrate it. So there was just this plethora of news articles last year, and um, we ended up having a really amazing um, celebration last June. So I know uh, Robert and Barbara came to some of those. Did anybody else get out to that last June? Ah, shoot. 
well, it was fun. Um, but before that, 1974, some of you guys maybe know Farron Doss. Um, he was uh, at the University of Montana. So these folks <coughs> got together and decided they wanted to recreate the ride. And imagine that before GPS and um, that website I was telling you about with all the newspaper articles. So they were really digging into the, the archives to figure out where to go. And they <coughs> got together. And um, so it was Farron Doss, Richard Smith, and a student named David Watson. Uh, who decided to recreate the ride, and then they enlisted seven other students from the African American Studies Department. They averaged about 77 miles per day. Yeah, and they rode their bikes from 5.30 in the morning to noon each day. Um, mostly they were on paved roads with modern bicycles, but definitely appreciated the hardships. These guys, uh, the original riders, had single seat speed bikes. So just imagine, no, no gears. Thankfully, our friends in 1974 had fancier bikes than that. Um, so this past year, Eric Zedeno is over here, and I think his family's from, oh shoot, I can't remember, um, but it's, he's from the Caribbean, um, but he's lived in the U.S. for a long time. He had gotten into this story a few years ago. He's a bicycle uh, backpacker, and he'd re recreated the, um, the uh, Underground Railroad Trail via bike, and so he decided he was going to do the same thing. And so he, he came to visit the fort a bunch of times and to get information. And then you can see him here in Livingston recreating the same picture there. And then I have a little video of his to show too at the end. <clears throat> um, so this is about the, uh, Bobby was insistent we say sesquicentennial, which is really hard to say, sesquicentennial celebration. So we had five days of celebration starting on June 14th, which is the Army's birthday. So we had a party for the, for the Army. And um, <clears throat> folks that were descendants of Buffalo soldiers came from all over the country. And also we had guest speakers um, that focused on different aspects of them, of the history. Um, and then on the 19th of June, we had a Juneteenth celebration. And Juneteenth is the day that we celebrate the end of slavery. Um, and it was a really amazing experience. Um, it got a lot of community groups together with the fort that we hadn't interacted with before. Um, and so hopefully those will be partnerships to come. Um, it was a lot of fun. And then, okay, so this is a short video um, because I think Eric can describe his experience better than I can. Let's see if I can make it big. My mom would say, regardless of your skin color, regardless of how you speak or how you look, you could do anything you want. And she told me that from like two years old, three years old, four years old all the way up to she passed away, told me that. And I, till this day, believe that. I'm Eric Cedeno, and on social media, people know me as the Bicycle Nomad. I did the Underground Railroad in 2014 and 2020, and that's when I started thinking, maybe I should travel through history with the bike. And that's how this project came alive. On June 14 of 2022, I'm retracing the original route of the 1897 expedition of the Bicycle Corps, the Buffalo Soldiers. It was an experiment. They wanted to see if they could use the bicycle as a method of transportation for war. So in 1897, they went from Fort Missoula, Montana to San Luis, Missouri, 1,900 miles, 41 days on a bicycle. Let's have him get the Explorer's Club flag. I was inspired because there were people of color, black men traveling by bike, and I did not see that in history books. I didn't see it on social media. So when I came across this, I'm like, wow. These are people that look like me and travel by bicycle like me. And I just wanted to, to learn more about it. <laughs> yeah, to me, um, I was fascinated the first time I read the story of the Buffalo Soldiers, the Bicycle Corps. It's about 12, 13 years ago, and I was just fascinated with the, how the bikes look. Mm -hmm. Then I was fascinated that it was um, 20 black soldiers mm -hmm. and how they packed and all that stuff. Then I went deeper into the history and, and into Spanish War and to, um, into Brownsville and to what happened some, to some of those guys. So uh, it's the reason why I'm here. It's the reason why I want to give them dignity mm -hmm. uh, I want, I want to tell the truth as well because I think there's, uh, there's some missing parts that have not been told and 
and uh, and that's why I'm here. Good morning, finally here, June 14, 2022, 125 years um, in the making. Buffalo Soldiers retracing history. Before I do a trip, a historical trip, I like to connect with the people in the history, uh, the people in the story. So I wanted to tell them to guide me through the routes that they took. Um, for me, ancestors are powerful. So I was telling them Private John Finley, Private John Wilson, Mingo Sanders, please guide me through the same routes that you guys took. So protect me. And it was just giving me a little safety before I left, you know. I feel energetic to finally be on the route of the Buffalo Soldiers. Day number three, I'm in Elliston, Montana, on my way to Helena, Montana, and stopping at Fort Robinson. can't go across the creek up over the other side of the hill, which is called 16 Mile Creek, because they took the bridge out. Well, this has to be one of the most challenging days on this expedition. I always said, while I was riding my bike, if it wasn't that I was paying homage to Buffalo Soldiers, the Bicycle Corp, I probably would have quit this trip. Uh, rain is about to come. It's really dark. And I still have about 30 more miles. And the more I read, the more I dig in to the story, I can see that there's a lot of gaps. We can't figure out names of the guys. I could tell you who the lieutenant was, who the doctor was, and who the journalist was. But how come I cannot tell the name and the faces of 20 black soldiers? Why was that not as important as the other guys? Without those 20 guys, we would not be sitting here because history would not have been made without those 20 guys. So the dignity has to be given to those men because it wasn't given to them while they were alive. This bike trip is only 10, 15% of the work that I'm about to do, which is making sure that all these guys are recognizable by face and name, that they have a gravestone, tombstone, proper burial. To me, they are my heroes. Those are the guys that I look up to. About a week ago, my dad said, maybe you were selected to do this thing. That's emotion. Regardless of what you look like, regardless of how you speak, your accent, you can be whatever you want to be. You can travel wherever you want to go. And it's just, she will always say that when I was a kid. I never understood that until now as a father. And I'm all. Tell that to him. Same thing to my son. 
He could be whatever he wanted to be, regardless of how he looks. All right. That always gets me. <laughs> so hopefully that brings everything kind of all the way around. And you can see, like, even though this happened 125 years ago, oh, man, I'm getting all choked up. <laughs> Um, it still has a big impact on people today. So um, if I'm happy to answer questions, but before I forget, I just wanted to point out some other places where you can get more information. Um, there's a really awesome PBS documentary that came out probably in like 2000 or 2002 called um, Bicycle Corps America's ba Black Army on Wheels. And you can get that off of YouTube um, for free, which is awesome. Um, and it really kind of goes through so much of the history that I didn't get to today. Um, <clears throat> there's also some great articles. Um, that Smithsonian one, if you just say Smithsonian um, Iron Riders 2022, it'll pop up. <clears throat> and I'm, I like that one, not just because I'm quoted in it, but <laughs> and then a couple more options there. And then there's some online exhibits that are interesting as well. Um, I just want to show you that blog spot that I was telling you about that has all the really amazing details, um, if you're a detail person. So this guy, I really want to like find this guy and give him a hug because he makes my job so much easier. This guy's name is Mike Higgins and he's just, he's a history teacher, I think, in Wyoming. Um, he was at some of the, <coughs> some of the, um, sesquicentennial, uh, events in St. Louis, so I didn't get to meet him, but he has gone through and gone day by day um, for every day that they were on the road and found um, something about it. So he's got the details from Lieutenant Moss's report and then he usually has a quote um, somewhere there too. He also um, <coughs> has gone through and tried to figure out more information about the writers. So, you know, in Eric's video, he talked about how um, they don't have, we don't have names for them. We do have names, but we don't have names and faces that are connected, you know. So we know who Lieutenant Moss was. And so <clears throat> this, uh, this teacher here has gone through and tried to figure out, you know, who each of these people are. Um, and so sometimes he finds their enlistment records and figures out where he is. So he's done a lot of really great research there. So if you feel like going down a research hole, um, it's a fun one. So let's see. Eugene Jones was the one that got sent back, I think. Yeah. No! <laughs> Which is, I need to go find him, but. Um, I should, I should. I've emailed him once, but I didn't have a, I think it's the old email that's connected to this, but I know that Bobby, the organizer guy I was talking about, he's connected to him, so I should, thank you for mentioning that. I should get him out here. <clears throat> I'm sure that he would be really fun to talk to. Um, this particular, this guy, um, Mike Higgins, he also did his own reenactment of the ride with his mom as like a support wagon. So, so Mike Higgins, if you are watching this MCAT, uh, please contact me. I'll find him. Um, <clears throat> okay, so what questions can I answer for you? It's one of these subjects that I know so much about, it's hard to figure out what's, what I should say. So I hope that you guys got something from it, but I'm also happy to answer questions. Yes. Oh, that one I don't know. About a year? I think they were in Cuba for about a year. So all my military historians out there um, can smack me for not remembering how. Yes, yes, they were definitely fighting. Mm -hmm. And then they went to the Philippines and fought in the Philippines. And there's actually a, a film reel of the 25th Infantry, like one of those super, super early film reels. You can see them. It's pretty amazing. So what else can I get? Yeah, Barbara. I, I, I'm all right with that. Um, from looking at the exhibit in the fort uh -huh. many times, I think I remember that there were modifications that had to be done yeah. to the bicycle mm -hmm. equipment in order for them to do this longer journey yeah. than just the Yellowstone. And I, but I don't remember the details. Can, can you go into that? Yep. Let me find a picture. I think this one is... Yeah, so <clears throat> they have these um, equipment boxes in here, um, like a luggage case. Some of them are leather, but they actually made a couple that were metal. And so they doubled as pots for cooking over the fire. So um, <clears throat> one or two of them would be uh, metal pieces that you could put together to turn into a pot to, to do cooking. So you didn't have to actually um, pack pots and pans as well. So kind of crazy. 
they were just kind of, it's like you're a, a early um, ultralight backpackers or ultralight bike packers. Okay, what else can I? Who was president when they were acknowledged finally? Ah, uh, it was Nixon actually, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry to say that disdainfully. I was just like, oh yeah, it was Nixon, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, no, so I should, I should clarify that. So um, <clears throat> the term buffalo soldier is just a broad description of an African-American soldier when the, when the army was segregated. And that comes, there's a lot of different myths around it. So some folks say that it's because of um, the, their ferocity in battle as they were fighting um, Native American folks. Um, but other folks say it might have had to do with the fact that in the West, especially in states like Montana where it was cold, they would wear uh, bison robes, buffalo robes. You can see a lot of these guys, they're at Fort Keogh, um, are wearing buffalo robes. And then other people say it's because of the texture of their hair was similar um, to bison. So Native American folks made that reference. Yeah. You see them and they're dressed in this very handsome hat. Uh -huh. And yet today all our bicycle riders have to have helmets. Yes. And yet these guys did far more dangerous riding. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, it probably still would have been a good idea for them to have helmets. But as far as we know, no, none of them fell off and bonked their heads. So they were okay. But uh, you also think about the speed that bikes go now um, compared to the speed that they were going then. And the fact that we have to deal with uh, uh, traffic, right? So like maybe falling off your bike, you're not gonna get hit, hurt that badly, but if you get knocked off your bike going fast by a car, more likely to need a helmet. That's a good point. They were not wearing, you know, uh, I mean, if you're cycling in these boots, I don't know. What else can I, yeah, Maria. Um, so you mentioned that they, just the Buffalo Soldiers in general, these, you know, peacekeeping from Native uh -huh. Americans yeah. and other oppressed groups. And I think you also mentioned for mining disputes. Mm -hmm. So do we have any records of them, like, intervening with mining disputes with, like, the Chinese? Mm, not so much the Chinese. It was usually, like, union busting. So, uh, like, um, and the folks in Wallace, Idaho, have a an exhibit in their museum, in their mining museum, about the Buffalo Soldiers. Um, so my dates always get a little bit fuzzy because the, we had Buffalo Soldiers in Montana for, for decades, um, and they weren't always at Fort Missoula. Um, so they ended up in Wallace, Idaho, strike breaking, basically, um, or keeping the peace when there was some sort of uh, labor dispute. But they also, and so they weren't very well liked in Wallace, Idaho at that point. However, 1910 fires came around and you know all of Washington and Idaho is ablaze and a lot of the Buffalo soldiers from around Montana um, were shipped to fight fires in Glacier and in Wallace and so they ended up um, saving a lot of people. And so now there's like a monument to them and, and like sort of the, the idea, the feeling towards Buffalo soldiers before the 1910 fires and after, very different in Wallace, so. Uh, anything? Yeah, Robert. Uh, perhaps someone in here, as I followed the clip that the recent uh, an actor that uh -huh. made the entire trip, yep. I recognized going up to Blackfoot. Uh -huh. But if anybody in here know where that was, where the bridge was closed? It, it looked like the Missouri, part of the Missouri, but I don't know. Well, wasn't that somewhere in Helena? Is that not true? I can't remember. It was when he got to Helena that he, I believe. Did it look familiar to you, Robert, or are you just curious? Yeah, it could possibly have been the Missouri, but it's not between. I think we can, um, we can probably go back on Eric's uh, Instagram and find that day, because he was posting like every day. So you and I can nerd out about it one of these days, or we could just email it. thing is, if you are unfortunate enough today to land in the infantry, you still carry one half of the shelter. Oh, yeah. Your partner has. Oh, that's good to know. <clears throat> so one thing I don't think I mentioned um, <clears throat> when we were talking about it earlier was that the 
combined weight of the bike and all the gear for each person was about 80 pounds. So single speed up these mountains. They did a lot of walking. They used a lot of the railroad um, tracks to walk along. So they had, they had a tough go of it for sure. So I'm sure they were uh, hungry for their dinners every night. So any other thoughts or questions? Um, so we do have a, in our permanent exhibit, we do have a section about the Buffalo Soldiers, about the 25th Infantry, um, and we have a replica bike there so you can kind of see it up close and look at some of the gear, um, which is nice. And then in our NCO quarters, we have like a temporary exhibit that has some more information about um, the 25th Infantry Band and the 25th Infantry at Fort Missoula beyond just the Bicycle Corps. So, um, oh, I forgot to put this one on here, but if you're interested in sort of the history of uh, black people in the early 1900s in Montana, um, in Missoula specifically, there is a guy named Greg Martin who did some research on the AME church that was on the west side, um, and he publishes on medium.com. Um, so if you, if you sort of Google Greg Martin medium, um, you can get to his collection of articles. He's been doing a lot of research on the 24th infantry, um, which I know almost nothing about. So. <clears throat> Um, it's been really educational for me as well. There are a lot of folks around who are doing cool research and archival work. So it'll be interesting, you know, in five years if we know more about the individuals that were um, in the Bicycle Corps or just more about Buffalo Soldiers in general. Yes? Are you saying that, that you do have photos of them on other documents? We do have, we have photos. And we have documents, so we have lists of names, but we don't have them together. Yeah, so there are some folks who can put them together. Um, oh, yeah, right? I know. Yeah, if you could just Google search. Yeah, there's, there's a couple, like one who got arrested. Yeah, so he, he, he's, his photo is somewhere else, and you can match him up. But, but yeah, it's not, not, not as good um, as we'd like. So, What was that? Oh, yes, good question. Um, so, so even though um, Lieutenant Moss was like, this is amazing, this is cheaper, um, shortly then they got sent to Cuba, and then shortly after that, we're talking early 1900s, um, the sort of uh, mechanization of the country uh, picked up, and so they realized that, you know, they were going to have steam engines and um, cars very soon. You know, it wasn't too far down the line, so they decided that that was a better investment than um, putting an entire regiment on bicycles. They did decide that it was still good for um, uh, couriers and, and mail and like messages back and forth, but not on a wide scale like Lieutenant Moss wanted. So. Yeah. And Dorsey was the last name of the one that's out in the cemetery? Uh-huh, Dorsey is one of them, yep. Yep, yep, and he lived on the west side. There's a historic marker, or there's a historic record for it, so on the city website. Um, also, if you're interested in more information about uh, black people in Montana, um, the Montana Historical so Society has an online exhibit all about um, different regions of Montana and, you know, there were, uh, who was doing what at what time. It's pretty fascinating. So, and now I'm really stuffy. Yeah. So, for, like, the ones who ended up settling in Missoula, uh -huh. are there any, like, maybe records, like, of when they bought a house? Yes. Or like that? Mm -hmm. That's another way to connect them? Yes, yeah, and like Mr. Dorsey, I don't know if there are pictures of him, that's a good question, because he owned a business in town and his family was here for a while, so there's probably some pictures of him, um, but I haven't seen them, so. But yeah, that's a, good, that's a good call. We have more information about him, but still not necessarily a photo. Okay, yeah, Robert. I asked the reenactors uh -huh. if any of those bicycles exist today. Mm -hmm. And he left me with the impression that after the trip, actually those bicycles that those men used uh -huh. were on loan from the manufacturer, yep. and they were turned back to the manufacturer. <clears throat> that is true. And to the best of their knowledge, the reenactors that were here last year, no authentic that made the trip exist. Yep, that is true. Yep, uh, the, the Army said, go ahead and send those back to Spalding, and that was the end of that. So, 
Okay, well, thank you guys all for coming tonight. I appreciate it. If you want to come and ask questions um, personally to me, I'm happy to answer questions. Or if you want to just come and look at this beautiful bicycle seat that they rode 1,900 miles on, um, you're welcome to come up and check things out. So thank you guys. I hope I see you out at the fort sometime.